In Britain, the walls of power have long whispered a rule. What happens behind closed doors stays behind closed doors. But some walls have grown rotten with age, keeping secrets that darken each generation they touch. When Prince Harry and Meghan Markle dare to pull back the curtain and reveal what lays behind the shadows of British aristocracy, they didn't just shake the monarchy. They exposed an entire culture deeply invested in secrecy and silence. For that, they've become the most convenient villains, attacked from every angle and relentlessly dissected by the British media. Few have seized this opportunity with more zeal than Cameron Roy of the Daily Mail. Known for his sensationalist jabs at Meghan, Roy has crafted a narrative that would have readers believe she's to blame for all the woes of the British monarchy. And perhaps, if he could manage it, all of Britain. In one particularly mean-spirited article, he mocked Meghan for not passing a diplomatic exam, writing that it put straight A student Meghan Markle in her place. Hmm. With each article, he paints Meghan not as a woman advocating for her family's dignity, but as some sinister force, destabilizing institutions that had, until her arrival, strived under silence and secrecy. But why such venom? The answer lies particularly in what Megan represents. She is a symbol of defiance against a cultural code that teaches British children early on to remain silent in the face of abuse. In British boarding schools, the deeply entrenched culture often justifies physical and emotional punishment, training students to bury empathy to survive by turning a blind eye. James O'Brien, a prominent British broadcaster, has spoken about this cultural phenomenon, noting that many children are taught to rationalize the abuse they endure. Learning from a young age that silence is survival. It's a cultural wound, deep and unspoken, and as these children grow into adults, they become the very establishment figures who uphold this silence. Then there is the case of the Arch Archbishop Justin Welby, who recently resigned amid revelations that he had known and had failed to act on child abuse by John Smythe an evangelist associated with the Church of England. The abuse spanning decades and affecting over a hundred boys was hidden by a veil of institutional protection. Yet when the abuse finally came to light, Roy didn't lead with smite horrific actions or the institution's failure to protect its most vulnerable. Instead, this journalist, he zeroed in on Welby's poor judgment and implied that the Archbishop had somehow been tainted by his friendship with Harry and Megan. Hmm. The audacity is staggering. Here is an article where the abuse of over a hundred children is downplayed. All to suggest that Welby's real mistake was 
sympathizing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. This is journalistic fraud at its finest. Roy's article is a calculated hit piece, manipulating the story's gravity to suit his ongoing campaign against Meghan. As James O'Brien said, the tabloids will find a way to link or blame Meghan Markle for all the ills of the United Kingdom. But this particular attempt reveals just how far they'll stretch to do so. Even using the suffering of victims to push an agenda, it's a deflection, a bait and switch that diverts attention from an establishment unwilling to confront its own shadows. And it's not just the church or the press. Look at Prince Andrew, a man who became embroiled in scandal after scandal, facing allegations that would destroy most men's reputation. Yet the royal establishment continued to protect him. His security paid by the crown? Why? Because he kept his mouth shut. He kept his silence. He played the game, protecting the institution over transparency, over truth. Meanwhile, Harry, who dared to speak about his experiences, about the suffocating nature of palace life and the racism his wife faced, was cast out. And that's a generous word to use. Because if we are to be honest, he was forced out and flee for his safety and the safety of his family. Now, he had broken the secret rule of silence and the establishment responded by treating him as an outsider, a prince without a kingdom. This pattern is clear. Those who reveal the truth are punished. Those who stay silent are shielded. Meghan and Harry's mistreatment is just the most recent high-profile example of what happens when the British establishment is challenged. Meghan wasn't mocked for failing a diplomatic exam. She was mocked because her very presence and voice threatened a cultural tradition that prizes secrecy over accountability. But how much longer can this continue? Welby's resignation marks a crack in the walls of secrecy. Yet the media has already started to twist it into another excuse to demonize Harry and Meghan. How much longer will the British people be content to let their media, their institutions, deflect and protect at the expense of truth? How many more children, women and men must suffer under the weight of secrets kept too long? Now, summarizing the entire sort of article, if we want to call it that, that Cameron Roy wrote, I, I would say it, it, the intention of it is to frame Archbishop Justin Wilby's resignation over the abuse scandal as a consequence of his alleged spellbound relationship with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. 
Rather than focusing on the actual issues of institutional abuse and ne negligence within the Church of England, Roy criticizes Welby's sympathy for the Sussexes, suggesting that his association with them compromised his judgment and led him to prioritize their needs over church obligations. So because he was talking to them, he couldn't pay attention to the other stuff. Are you for real? Right? The article digs up past controversies surrounding Welby's interactions with Harry and Meghan, such as he missed a meeting with church clergy. Instead, he went and he did Prince Archie's christening. I didn't think that would be a controversy. He's the head of the Church of England and the Queen is the head at the time. And her great-grandchild is getting christened. So he uses stuff like that as evidence of Welby's supposedly misstepping, sidelining side his core issues, his core responsibilities. Therefore, he couldn't see the abuse. He didn't know about it. He sidesteps very easily and not talking about the secrecy that exists and how the church mishandled allegations against John Smythe. Ultimately, Roy's piece diverts attention from the scandal itself by subtly painting Harry and Meghan as negative influence on Welby's decisions, reducing a series of institutional failings to tabloid gossip. If Roy had done his job, if he were a real journalist, he would know that the person actually, the prince that was very close to the Archbishop, is not Harry and Meghan. It's Prince William. But no, this 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 hit piece, this this fantasy is just there to create a digital record that continues to show Meghan Marco in a negative way. So four decades from now, a century from now, there'll be these ridiculous articles about how mean and awful and abusive Meghan Markle is. That's all this is. They're creating a digital record, inventing stories so that there is a history, a digital record that she was not a good person because they need, they have the need to taint the black biracial Duchess, not doing his job at all, or perhaps he is. How sad. Now, the other thing he never mentioned is that people like Angela Levin, who consistently and viciously with venom scrutinizes and criticizes every single step or move that Meghan makes. She pretends that she knows Prince Harry intimately and she knows his thoughts because he granted her a couple of hours in an interview, which she has inflated to, it was months that she spent with him. Now, when she had the, the opportunity to report one of the most prolific abusers, she didn't. And there's evidence of it. It's not a scenario that... You, you, a nurse tells you uh, that Jimmy Savile comes to visit her hospital and he molests disabled girls, right? Which is sort of what, that's what she told you, is that right? And then you then feed that back to the investigations team or some senior people at the mail, and they go to work attempting to substantiate that. And he's caught, and then maybe even hundreds of victims 
are prevented from ever being molested? Um, it's not a scenario that ever happened. I don't think I went back and told the investigators. No, but I'm saying if if you had, if you'd sort of blown don't the whistle. Don't blame this on me. No, no, I'm just yeah. trying to, I'm trying to, in a sense, um, I mean, I think there are lots see of people. if there's more we could have done. You know, we as a society are attempting to learn from what's happened. Yes, I think you mustn't be overwhelmed by someone's fame. And I think nobody is in the same way. You know, he was very, very famous. He had very, very good connections. He the hypocrisy is staggering. And the silence, <laughs> deafening. It's time to confront the real issue to shine a light into the dark corners of these institutions. Harry and Meghan's decision to speak out wasn't an act of betrayal. It was a necessary breaking of the silence. A call to pull back the curtain and let the truth come forth. If we, as a society, are ever to break this cycle. We must stand with those who reveal, who speak, who defy the silence. We must hold accountable those who hide behind closed doors and who protect their power at the expense of others. As James O'Brien suggests, there can be no empathy, no justice, no healing until this culture of silence is shattered once and for all. Only then will we begin to reckon with the truth, no matter how painful. And perhaps finally begin to heal. There's no doubt that the British media is fixated on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, and they will continue, continue writing their negative and abusive narrative to fulfill the image and the story they want the public to have of Meghan and Harry. But the more they do this, the more outrageous it becomes, people are starting to wake up and realize that the so-called journalist and British media is not a true representation of the people and what they call journalism is far from. At the end, I feel sorry for Cameron Roy whether he is at this point of his career, the journey of his career, making choices that, in his purview, may benefit him. But what is it that he has to give up? What is it that he is betraying of his journalistic training in order to have his name printed on tabloid press what is it that he's given up where he's not telling the stories that really matter and telling them truthfully? I feel an enormous amount of empathy and sadness because if this is what he starts his career with, if this is the kind of stories that he decides to invent and create, you are no journalist. You are a fraud. And for that, I feel an enormous amount of empathy and sorrow for you. I wish you all the best. Wings on butterflies at last Gold fables with red letters
Do it.